today we are going to talk about the inflammation uh, in last lecture we have studied about the immunity and different type of immune cells so in that topic we studied that uh, there are certain cells and there is certain mechanism by which our body uh, give a response to some foreign particles foreign microorganisms so as a result of that uh, response there will be certain changes at a local area or uh, sometime uh, generalized so that is what we call as the inflammation so inflammation is also a, a response uh, which a body shows in order to eliminate in order to destroy certain damaging factors and some antigens uh, so what is inflammation inflammation is the body's mechanism for coping with agents that could damage it so it is a response to a damaging factors in other words inflammation is a protective response to rid the body of the cause of cell injury and the resultant necrotic cells that cell injury produces the basic steps in acute inflammation allows white blood cells to move from the blood to the tissue location where they are required so what happened for example uh, when any intage in any foreign particle enters into your body the immune cells especially the macrophages they are the antigen presenting cell they engulf the bacteria and present the antigen to the t cells along with that there will be activation of different other cells including the mast cells so all these they causes release of different sort of cytokines and these cytokines they causes different effects they causes vasodilation they causes chemotaxis they causes some sort of fever development a rise in temperature so vasodilation leads to leakage of fluid chemotaxis causes entry of white blood cells to the inflammatory area and certain interleukin or cytokines they causes a rise in temperature so our body can fight and will not allow the microorganism to proliferate so the vasodilation is a vascular changes that we can see in case of inflammation and chemotaxis is the cellular changes that we can see in inflammation and all these changes they are dependent on different sort of interleukins and cytokines also they are saying that in case of acute inflammation the wbc's they move from the blood to the tissues so they can fight with the bacteria and damage the bacteria there are two types of inflammation number one is acute inflammation and number second is chronic inflammation what does acute inflammation mean acute inflammation has a rapid onset last for minutes to days and is characterized by exudation of fluid and protein from the vessel because of vasodilation and immigration of the neutrophils so that is the chemotaxis so both components we can see in case of acute inflammation first component is the vasodilation or the vascular component that causes leakage of fluid and that is called as the exudates and number second is the immigration of the neutrophils is the cellular event which further comprises of uh, there will be rolling there will be adhesion there will be diapedesis and there will be chemotaxis so these are the steps of the cellular changes that we will discuss in another lecture so the two thing and number uh, second important point that you need to remember is the acute inflammation is a rapid onset and neutrophils in this condition the symptoms appear uh, in a short time and it can leads to drastic changes in the body that can sometime leads to death so acute mean short time and neutrophil predominant what does the chronic inflammation mean chronic inflammation is a reverse of acute inflammation it takes longer time longer course days to years and involve lymphocyte and macrophages also in chronic inflammation 
tissue repair coexist with tissue destruction. So, chronic inflammation is a type of inflammation which is characterized by gradual onset of the symptoms, gradual, gradually progression of the disease and the presence of lymphocyte and macrophages as a component of cellular changes. So I think you have got the idea. So here we can see eosinophils, lymphocytes, basophils, platelets, monocytes, neutrophils, band cell and the erythrocyte. So here the lymphocyte and the monocyte which, which when comes out of the blood circulation is called a macrophage. So these are the sign of chronic inflammation, the cells of the chronic inflammation. What about the neutrophil? A cell of acute inflammation. And what about the band cell? It's an immature neutrophil and this is also a sign of acute inflammation. If any, if any, uh, any area of the body is uh, damaging or there is sort of some inflammation and a, a lot of neutrophils are there then the demand or uh, we can see uh, the neutrophil count in the circulation will be reduced because a lot of neutrophil they uh, go to the inflammatory sites uh, as a result of that the bone marrow they try to make more and more neutrophil and some neutrophil they jump into the circulation immaturely so they are called as the band cells so we can see that in case of uh, acute inflammation if the progression is so fast then we can see we can also see some sort of band cells the next is the cardinal signs that what are the signs that we can see in case of inflammation so there are certain signs that will show that yes here there is inflammation so the cardinal signs of inflammation including a rubber collar dollar tumor and loss of function so if any area is uh, infected by some microorganism then there will be uh, infiltration of neutrophils, infiltration of macrophages, re release of different sort of cytokines, vasodilation, chemotaxis, and certain a lot of other mechanisms, you know, processes they are going on. And as a result of all those things, there will be certain changes. So, what are the changes? The changes in uh, redness or red discoloration, as we can see here. They will be hot because of vasodilation. They will be hot, that is called as the col color. Then there will be dollar mean pain because release of different sort of cytokine histamine bradykinin interleukin so they uh, prostaglandins you know they cause this uh, pain and there will be exudates because of vasodilation there will be leakage of fluid uh, into that particular area and this exudation or the leakage of fluid from the vessel and accumulate into the uh, interstitial space that cause swelling and that is called as the tumor and definitely uh, there will be destruction of the tissue because of inflammation then there will be loss of function of the specific tissues what are the causes of inflammation uh, some causes of inflammation it could be infection it could be trauma it could be physical or chemical agents some necrotizing factors some foreign bodies or there will be immune reactions that can cause inflammation the pathogenesis of the inflammation may be of three component phases Number first mean is the alteration, exudation and cell proliferation. Classification is also very important because uh, uh, different uh, etiological agents uh, that can cause uh, different types of inflammation. So it could be serous inflammation, it could be fibrinous inflammation, it could be purulent inflammation, it could be hemorrhagic or cataral inflammation. Just a small a rapid revision or rapid so i have as i have said that whenever there will be inflammation there will be release of different sort of inflammatory mediators and one of them is cytokine that can cause increase in the permeability and increase in permeability causes leakage of fluid if this is only and only the transudate or exudative fluid which is a very clear fluid with low protein content uh, then we can say that this is the serous exudate or the serous inflammation because only watery fluid is leaking out from the blood vessels so one of the example is rhinitis or uh, the cold fever there will be discharge clear watery discharge from the nose is an example of the serous inflammation so if the inflammation is so high and the permeability is increasing and it increases uh, to such an extent that the larger plasma proteins like fibrin 
they start to leak out and they start to deposit here so they form a fibrinous network along with some exudates so that is what we call as the fibrinous inflammation if there is any particular inflammatory area where there is a lot of bacteria and a lot of dead bacteria along with damaged neutrophils along with live neutrophils and there is a necrotic area you know with appears like like a pus so if the pus is there because of fight between the neutrophil and the bacteria then we can call we, we call such inflammation is a purulent inflammation and hemorrhagic if there is leakage of rbc's also then we can find a lot of rbc's at the inflammatory area so that is the hemorrhagic and cateral inflammation usually we can see in case of uh, respiratory infections and gi infections because these respiratory or the GIT linings you know they have a mucous membrane or uh, they have a, um, a mucous secreting cells so these uh, mucous secreting cells or the epithelial cells when there will be inflammation there will be hypersecretion of mucin so there will be mucinous inflammation or the exudates so that is what we call it the cateral inflammation so in this a histological image we can uh, we try to figure out that is it acute inflammation or chronic inflammation so uh, if i find here the neutrophils then i can say this is the acute inflammation which organ is this it's an it is an example of tubule acu acute tubulo interstitial necrosis or inflammation so here the neutrophils the pretubular capillaries so these are the tubular network the epithelial lining some inflammatory cells invading the tubule so it means there is a damage of the tubule also there is a tubulitis itis inflammation then there will be complete damage of some uh, tubular cells with the loss of nuclei and can also find some neutrophils in the interstitium and some eosinophils also will be there so presence presence of eosinophil in 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 the interstitium is a hallmark for tubular interstitial nephritis so this is an example of the acute inflammation of kidneys especially the tubular and interstitial areas here also the eosinophil so this neutrophil the presence of neutrophil giving us head toward the acute inflammation so this is the gross image of the kidney where we can see increase in the size of kidney along with some reddish areas so this is these are the inflammatory areas so this is an example of the acute inflammation of kidney or acute nephritis is here we can see all the cardinal signs the loss of function red in color or red discoloration uh, if the uh, visceral layer is involved then there will be pain then there will be swelling so all cardinal signs we can also find saying that it's acute inflammation of the kidney no stain type is acute organic kidney sign inflammation we know swelling redness pain loss of function areas i showed you the area and location of organ it is uh, present in the flank retroperitoneally so now we try we will try to uh, see that uh, which organ is this and what type of inflammation is going on here so now now i can see that if this is the tubular network and this is the tubular network i can see a lot of in neutrophilic infiltrations trilobe nuclei in the tubule as well as in the interstitium so the presence of neutrophil inside the tubule and in the interstitium will give me a hint of acute tubular necrosis or acute tubular interstitial nephritis okay it's tubular interstitial so this is again the example 
that we already discussed and that we discussed above so this is the example of acute tubulo interstitial inflammation of the kidneys so the description acute tubulo interstitial inflammation of the kidneys HNE staining type is acute inflammation organist kidney the next one is the example or the specimen taken from myocardium or the heart so these are the myocardial uh, the myocardium so these are the myocardium this is what the lymphocyte infiltration nucleus nucleus along with lymphocyte infiltration as i said the lymphocytes have a big cytoplasm uh, big nucleus and a small scanty cytoplasm so here we cannot find neutrophil here we can find a lot of inflammatory lymphocytes so lymphocyte if present there along with some necrotic areas then the inflammation should be chronic so it's a chronic inflammation of myocardium or chronic myocarditis itis inflammation so it's an example of chronic myocarditis so chronic inflammation of myocardium or chronic myocarditis h any type of inflammation is chronic in the organism so we have talked about the acute and chronic inflammation now we will go for the serious inflammation so serious inflammation is a type of inflammation which is usually characterized by leakage of watery or transparent fluid out of the vascular system so if there is vasodilation and that can uh, cause uh, the leakage of only transparent fluid then we can say that there is an example of the serous inflammation so in this condition we can see that the skin there will be erythema there will be certain uh, uh, you can see uh, here leakage of the fluid and previously it was like this now after uh, the aspiration of the fluid of the rupture of the uh, this uh, blister then there will be a flattening of the blister so here we can see that this is the blister and these are the blisters so these blisters you know these are the watery filled ballooning of the skin so these is what we call as the example of the serous inflammation where we can only and only find some watery tra transparent watery discharge or fluid so this is the serous inflammation of the skin the serous dermatitis itis mean inflammation derma mean skin so it's a serous inflammation of the skin which is also called as serous dermatitis so what is it it is a type of exudative inflammation characterized by watery fluid microscopically if you want to check you want to see you can also find some sort of inflammatory cells especially the neutrophil along with some hyperemic areas and there will be edematous or dilated vessels so epidermis is spreaded from the dermis by a local collection of the serous effusion so dermis, there is a collection of fluid because of vasodilation that can cause swelling like this and separation from the epidermis and dermis there is separation between them and collection of water so they are saying that epidermis is spreaded from the derma by a local collection of the serous effusion derma is edematous with inflammatory hyperemia and some cellular infiltrates grossly we can find skin blisters is evident an acute type of inflammation uh, if we can find some neutrophils next one is a uh, fibrinous inflammation so the fibrinous inflammation is more severe than that of the serous inflammation because in this inflammation the vasodilation is more the permeability is more that allow the fibrin insoluble fibrin into the interstitium and they can cause this in fibrinous inflammation so fibrinous inflammation of the heart fibrinous inflammation is a type of exudative inflammation characterized by fibrin rich exudates so the exudate here this accumulation of fluid is rich in fibrin if it is rich in rbc's we can see hemorrhagic if it is only transparent we can say serous and in this case it is rich in fibrin deposits so we can say that this is the fibrinous pericarditis or fibrinous inflammation of the 
hard pericardium hard pericardium so it is also called as the hairy heart hairy heart because we can see that all these yellow depositions it is the pericardium and they taken out the pericardium so this is the fibrinous pericarditis and this is the lungs this one is the heart so it's a fibrinous pericarditis what are the other points that we can find in case of fibrinous pericarditis so microscopically we can find pink mass of fibrin exudates that lie over the pericardial surface we can also find neutrophilic infiltrations inflammatory hyperemia because of vasodilation are seen in the thick epicardium and grossly the thick epicardium or the pericardium covered with uh, friable gray mass with a hair like spongious form figurative name is the hair heart or hairy heart the pathogenesis this occurs as a consequence of severe injury with a resultant great greater vascular permeability to allow larger molecules uh, like fibrinogen to pass the endothelial barrier so there is will be leakage of fibrinogen type is a fibrinous pericarditis or fibrinous inflammation in the organ is heart the next one is the purulent inflammation so we can see that there is some discharge from the eye and this is what the pus it's a collection or it's a fluid a rich in neutrophil and some um, dead bacteria and live bacteria so it's an example of the purulent conjunctivitis where we can see a thick uh, yellowish discharge from the eyes so this is a purulent inflammation of the conjunctiva the purulent inflammation is a type of exudative inflammation characterized by neutrophil and death bacteria microscopically we can find a lots of inflammatory neutrophils and inflammatory hyperemia and also seen in the thick fluid grossly a thick mucopurulent discharge from the eye with the redness of eye redness is also a sign of uh, inflammation and mucopurulent discharge is uh, a hallmark for the purulent inflammation so it's a type of purulent inflammation and the organ is eye so here we can also find uh, also see that this is the example of the purulent pericarditis where we can see that this is the layer of pericardium and from the pericardium we have collected pus it's a thick you know yellowish fluid that contain neutrophil and dead bacteria and so this is what histologically we can also find a lot of inflammatory cells and some sort of areas of the hyperemia so these red areas you know the areas of the hyperemia along with the blood vessel dilated blood vessel and these are also the dilated blood vessels along with some different inflammatory neutrophilic infiltrations in the pericardium the next one is the purulent inflammation of the meninges of the brain so it's not now difficult because uh, this is the, the organ of the brain and at the base of brain we can find some thick discharge you know some thick mucopurulent fluid exudate so it's a uh, we can also see this condition usually in tb of uh, uh, the meninges where there will be a, a involvement of the meninges especially the subarachnoid space uh, where there will be collection of bacteria along with the neutrophilic infiltrations and death deposits the debris and that gives rise to a yellowish discharge discharge so it's a purulent inflammation of the meninges the basilar brain thick purulent fluid in the subarachnoid space type is the purulent inflammation and organ is the brain now this is what the catarrhal inflammation where we can see the inflammation of the uh, mucus secreting uh, <coughs> epithelium so this is the trachea we can see there is a this is the trachea and here we can see that these are the mucinous secretion so these are the gel gel gelatinous mucinous secretions so this is what the sign of exudation so this is the mucinous exudation that's why it is called as the lateral inflammation so it's a lateral inflammation of the trachea which has a mu uh, mucous membrane so it's a copious trachitis so copious is a fibrinous inflammation of the mucous membrane covered with the cuboid or a columnar epithelium lining on a thin solid base connective tissue 
the fabric film is friable easy to remove so there will be fabric film along with the mucinous discharge and uh, mucinous exudates so uh, this is this is an example of the catarrhal inflammation so and histologically what we can find that on microscopy there will be friable fabulous film can be seen as an eosinophilic meshwork of threads or amorphous coagulum on a erosion mucous membrane on grossly there will be gray friable film line on the mucous surface of the trachea so this is what the fabulous as well as not not a lot of fibrin there will be a lot of mucin some fibrin so it's a gelatinous uh, discharge here again the catarrhal inflammation of the GIT where we can find the stomach and we can find these are the discharge you know these are the exudates and which are a little bit thick and mucinous so these are the catarrhal inflammation next one is the hemorrhagic inflammation or uh, there will be enough leakage of RBCs so this is what your lungs and these are the hemorrhagic areas so there will be vasodilation that can cause leakage of RBCs collection of RBCs so exit it a rich in RBC so it's a hemorrhagic inflammation of the lungs hemorrhagic inflammation is a type of exudative inflammation characterized by rbc rich exudate on the blood microscopically you can find blood extravasation and grossly there will be blood stained hemorrhagic inflammation in the organ is lungs this is what microscopically we can find now we can see so these are the alveoli filled with rbcs some inflammatory cells in the interstitium so this is the example of hemorrhagic inflammation of lungs in the alveolar space and in the interstitium with blood and inflammatory cells as i shown you so these are the inflammatory cells inflammatory cells and interstitial rbcs inside the alveoli in the in the interstitium so this is what the hemorrhagic inflammation of lungs because there is inflammatory cells also present Hemorrhagic inflammation is a type of exudative inflammation characterized by an extravasation of RBCs and with other cells. Microscopically, we can find some RBCs, rich in RBCs and plus inflammatory cells. The type of inflammation is hemorrhagic inflammation and the organ is lungs. Another one is uh, the pulmonary abscess. It's a type of the purulent inflammation where the pus is localized to a certain area and is localized and is covered by a fibrinous capsule. So if I say that this is the purulent inflammation and the purulent inflammation is now covered by a fibrinous capsule. So it's restricted to this area only. So this is what we call as the abscess. So the organ is lungs and we can see that only this area is infected here also. So this is what the pulmonary abscess pulmonary abscess so abscess is uh, what we call abscess abscess is a type of the purulent inflammation uh, any to any localized area which is covered by a fibrinous capsule so in uh, x-ray we can find this is the abscess this is the fluid level and this is the air so this is the autopsy where they remove the material from inside but here we can see like this and this is the fluid this is the pus inside the fibrinous cape capsule and this is the air so air fluid level we can see in x-ray images of pulmonary abscess so let's talk something about the pulmonary abscess so it's a pulmonary abscess it's a lung abscess also called a pus filled cavity in the lung caused by an infection it's usually caused by bacterial infection and sometimes fungi or parasites. A lung abscess may be diagnosed with imaging study of the chest, studies of the chest. So features of the abscess, fluid filled cavity covered by a capsule with clear border on gross examination, hot on touch, filled with, they're filled with pus, bacteria and debris we can also find on microscopy. This is what the brain abscess. So we can see here that this is the clear border of the pus. 
So it's a brain abscess or cerebral abscess is the pus filled pocket of infected material in your brain. It is sometimes called as the brain abscess. An abscess can cause your brain to swell, putting harmful pressure on the brain tissues. Now if the abscess is there but there is no uh, clear border, there is no fibrinous capsule uh, surrounding the uh, pus that is called as the phlegmon. Usually it is a soft tissue swelling or soft tissue necrosis. Especially if the skin is involved then there will be subcutaneous purulent uh, inflammation and that is an example of the uh, fl uh, phlegmon. That this is the area of swelling. No. So under the skin we can see purulent inflammation, pus and that is not covered by any border. And they can spreading and going deeper to the tissues. So it's the phlegmon. Phlegmon is a medical term describing the inflammation of the soft tissues that spread under the skin or inside the body. It's usually caused by an infection and produces pus. The name phlegmon comes from the Greek word phlegmon meaning inflammation or swelling. Microscopically we can find diffuse and eutrophilic infiltration and inflammatory hyperemia also seen in the subcutaneous fat. So what are the features of the phlegmon? There no capsule, no clear border on those examination. Again hot on touch, filled with pus that contain bacteria and debris on microscopy we can see. This is an example of another type of purulent inflammation which you usually can see in body can, uh, body cavities like there will be pleural cavity, precardial cavity, peritoneal cavity. If there is cavity, uh, if there is a cavity and that cavity is filled with pyogenic inflammation or pyogenic uh, uh, material, so that is called as the empyma. So in this case, we can see that this is what the pleural cavity and inside the cavity, we can find pus. So if it is inside the body cavity, then we can call it as empyma. So what is empyma? It's a pleural empyma. Pleural empyma is a collection of pus in the pleural cavity caused by microorganism, usually bacteria. Often it happens in context with pneumonia, injury or the chest surgeries. It is one of the various kind of the pleural effusion. We have different sort of pleural effusion. If the pleural effusion containing pus, then we can say it's a empyma. The organ is the gallbladder and there is a collection of pus in this, in this cavity, in this uh, hollow uh, organ. Is called as the gallbladder empyma. So gallbladder empyma is a suppurative a result of the suppurative cholecystitis. Cholecystitis is an inflammation of the gallbladder. Suppurative is also called as the purulent. So as a result of purulent inflammation of the gallbladder, there will be accumulation of pus in the gallbladder, and this is what we call as the empyma of the gallbladder. So it's a gallbladder empyma. So it's an uncommon complication of cholecystitis and refer to a situation where the gallbladder lumen is filled and distended by the purulent material or the pus. So along with the pus, we can also find some stone. So gallstone along with the purulent inflammation in the gallbladder. The last one is uh, important one that is uh, because of res result of the empyma, uh, this condition can happen. And that is called as the empyma necessitans. So what is empyma necessitan? For example, if this is your lungs and there is chronic inflammation or uh, acute inflammation is going on in the uh, pleural space, then uh, there will be pyogenic accumulation. This purulent inflammation leads to uh, accumulation of pus into the uh, pleural space. So that is called as the empyma of the pleural, pleural space. And sometime this pleural pleural layer that has uh, pus inside you know it make a hole or uh, it infect the skin and also the chest muscles then gradually comes and lies just under the skin so it's dissect the chest wall and comes under the skin so if this is going on then this is what we call as the empyma necessitans. So what is this? So empyma necessitans is a rare complication of the pleural space infection and occurs when the infected fluid dissect spontaneously in the chest wall from the pleural space. 
this process may result from the bronchopleural extension of the peripheral lung infection so for example if there is lung infection then gradually lung infection enters into the pleura leading to pleural effusion if the effusion is pyogenic of pus then it is called as the pleural empyma gradually dissect the chest wall and just bulge under the skin so this is called as the empyma necessitates so you can see in this image that here is the chest chest wall lungs the vertebra so here we can see that in the pleural space this is the pleural space where we can see pus and this pus is gradually moving outside causing the skin causing skin swelling so here is also pus as we can see here on the posterior aspect we can see this subcutaneous or under the dermis or the epidermis or under the skin there is a collection of pyogenic substance so this is what we call as the empyma necessitance so thank you for listening